Welcome to Advanced Functions. Before I begin, um, I would like to ask you if you haven't subscribed to please subscribe to the channel so I know how many people are actually watching it. Um, grade 11 functions went very well. We had over 91,000 minutes of view time. So I decided that I, I would continue and do the grade 12 advanced functions for you. Now, um, as I go over the initial review here, I'm going to ask you to uh, refer back to some of the videos from functions 1.2 because I don't have the time to go over every lesson, but I will give you a brief overview. If you feel good with what I'm doing and you say, yeah, and I'll do that, then just go ahead, keep moving on. And if you need to go back to review, that would be a good idea. So this comes from the getting started section in the advanced functions textbook, which would probably be what your teacher would do on the first day of school. So also, if you have any comments or you'd like to say what city you're in or what school you go to or any comments suggesting any improvements to my website would be greatly appreciated. So here we go. We're going to start off with function notation. And again, back in the um, previous set of videos, this would be functions 1.2. So I put the referred um, lesson video in red here. So function notation is just a new way. Remember we talked about y equals something and now we're saying f at x equals something. So f at x implies that what you're dealing with is a function and it says f at x meaning whatever you put in for x changes the function, gives you the height of the function. So in some books they call this um, the input x would be your input and f of x would be your output. So if you see that in, in the textbook, input just means x and output means your f of x or y. Okay, so don't get confused by that. I never use that terminology, but uh, some teachers do. Okay, so for the first one, we have very basic function minus 4x plus 7. You should recognize it as a linear function and that it has negative slope. Right, the negative here, negative slope. So when you plug in a value, especially when you're dealing with negatives, you want to make sure that you put it in brackets like this before you evaluate it. So make sure, <coughs> remember a negative times a negative is a positive, so 8 plus 7 would give me 15. Very simple. The next one, a little more difficult, we are using x minus 2. So they want you to substitute all this in where you see an x. So you start again like this, put the brackets where the x was and plug in x minus 2 plus 7 and then expand and simplify. So minus 4x plus 8 plus 7 and that would be minus 4x plus 15. Um, this format might be a little different, a little trickier and some of you may have mixed this up when you were doing the um, the function notation, not knowing what to do with this 3. So the 3 means you're going to multiply, it's kind of good if you put brackets like this to see that I'm going to plug in 2x for my x and then everything gets multiplied by 3. Okay, so we're going to put a 3 out front because it has to be equal to and then we have 2x, we're going to square it and we're going to do minus 3 times 2x and plus 1, close a big bracket, because in the end we have to multiply this by everything inside. So I'm going to expand and simplify. So 2x squared is 4x squared times 2 is 8x squared minus 6x plus 1. And then finally I multiply by 3. So 24x squared minus 18x plus 3. And that's how you do the ones where there's a number in front of the function. The next thing we're going to talk about is factoring. Factoring is a really important skill. We've been saying that to you since grade 10, I'm sure. And there are different types of trinomials that normally you will need to factor. And in grade 12, most of the time they are trinomials. So we have simple trinomials. That's when the coefficient of x squared is a 1. So if it says x squared, I have 1x squared. 
as opposed to this one, which is complex, and I have six a squareds. So this makes it complex. The one in front makes it simple. If it's simple, all you need to do is write out two brackets with an x in the first position, and then figure out what multiplies to six and adds to five. So I like to write it out like this. This one's pretty simple, you wouldn't need to. So three times two, and a sum of 5 would be 3 plus 2. So I know my numbers are 2 and 3. Doesn't matter which order you put them back in here. You could have had x plus 3 times x plus 2. Okay, and moving on to complex trinomials here. Now this is a little trick here. And there is a really good lesson for you on the easiest way to factor. It's in the functions 2.3 section. There's three or four factoring videos there. So this time I'm looking for a product of 12 and a sum of 7 product, the first and the last, the sum of the one in the middle. So what multiplies to 12 and adds to 7? Well, 4 times 3 is 12, and 4 plus 3 is 7. And then all I have to do, and this is where people get all amazed at how easy this is, you take those two numbers, these two right here, and you put them, make a fraction out of them, put the first number on the bottom, and then you reduce. So this is going to be 2 over 3. 3 over 6 becomes 1 over 2. And then these are your, your numbers that are going to go into your factors. It's going to be 3a plus 2, 2a plus 1. 3a plus 2, 2a plus 1. And it's always a good idea to kind of double check. 3 times 2 is 6. And then I've got 3 and 4 is 7. And 2 times 1 is 2. So I know I'm right. Okay, so let's do this last one here. We'll do it a little quicker because now you get the idea. I'm looking for a product of 9 and a sum of minus 10. So if the product is positive and the sum is negative, they both have to be negative. Negative 1 and negative 9, right? Negative 1 times negative 9 is 9. Negative 1 plus negative 9 is negative 10. Make two fractions with the first on the bottom. Reduce and then you can stop. This one's already done. I can't reduce one third, but I can reduce minus 9 over 3 to minus 3 over 1. So the answer is there before your eyes, the variable on the bottom, the other on top. So that makes this 3m minus 1. And I'm multiplying it by m minus 3. Oops, a little too much pressure there. m minus 3, right? Okay, double check. I get my plus 3, I get 3m squared, and I do get minus 10 amps. Factor by grouping is another method that you use when you, normally when you have four, four terms. And if you look at this one here, you can see that if I factored an x out of these first two, and then I'd still be left with an x plus 1. So I can make this x squared times x plus 1 and then I still have plus 1 of these x plus 1's and then I can say this is a common factor here the x plus 1 so I take that out x plus 1 and I get x plus 1 times x squared plus 1 now you may have remembered there is something called a difference of squares there's no such thing for a sum of squares. So had this been x squared minus 1, you would have made it into x plus 1, x minus 1. But this is it. I can't factor that any further. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is transformations. Now transformations was a huge part of your grade 11 curriculum. So you should be pretty adept at that by now. If not, and you need some quick review, go to functions 1.7 called x's are weird and something else. So this is a general format for a transformation. y equals a, some function transformed, k, x minus d plus c. Now remember this function here can be anything. It could be a series of points on a graph that you want to transform. It could be one of those parent functions, which we're going to talk about in a middle, minute. Or it could just, the question might just say to you, tell me, um, what the transformations are and what is the mapping rule. So that might be another thing you might want to look up for mapping rules also near uh, functions 1.7. So when you first look at 
a transformation that's being requested, you have to make sure that this number here is factored. It has to say X here, not two X's. So the very first thing you always want to do is check to see if your teacher wanted to try to trick you like that. Okay, so now that I have it written in the best format to read the transformations, I can tell you what the transformations are. And I'm going to read them from left to right. And that would be also known as being in the correct order. Because as you see, as I go through what I state are things that require a multiplication or a division. So those always go first, like bed mass rules. So two, this two here, that's my A value. And that implies a vertical stretch by a factor of two. Remember that the numbers in front, whoops, I think I forgot the negative, didn't I? I'll put it back in here. There's still a minus here. So the two is a vertical stretch by a factor of two. The minus sign means reflection. Now, if you have trouble remembering about which, x which axis it's reflected by, reflection about the, you should remember that changes out front here are affecting y's. So if I'm affecting y, it means I'm going either uh, from up here, down here, or the other way around, depending on the function. So this is a reflection about the x-axis. The third, which is your k value here, this has to do with compressions and stretches of the x values. So x's are weird. It looks like it would be two times, but we're actually going to divide. So this is, means a vertical, sorry, a horizontal, because it's an x value, a horizontal compression by a factor of one half. So it's one over that value. The three, now again, this is within, this is all the x stuff right here, right? Everything else is y in the brackets x, outside y. And the three means it's going to be shifted. It's a horizontal shift. It says plus three, so it's going to be a horizontal shift left. It's the opposite. Three, we usually just say units. And finally, the minus one is a vertical shift down one unit. Now the next thing we're going to look at here is uh, the mapping rule. So what would I say I do to any values x and y of the function I'm trying to transform? So remember the x changes are in here. So x goes to 1 half x minus 3 and to the y's I multiply them by minus 2 and subtract 1. Okay, Make sure you've got this transformation stuff really nailed. It's important. Okay, parent functions. Now we've talked about parent functions in the other course. You use a lot of them, you transform them, and you have a number of different ones. You have x squared, you have absolute value of x, the root of x, a to the x, that's your exponential function, your one over x, and sine x. So you did some trig functions. You transformed all these in grade uh, 11. So this is just the outline of what the parent functions are. And I'm sure in each of the sections where you did exponentials or uh, trigonometric uh, functions, you also did transformations there as well. So if you need to go back and check that, we're going to do a little one here, just a negative one half sine 2x. Now, you should remember that the half means it's going to be, so let's draw sine x just first of all here. So here, let's say this is sine x here. So we know it has a period of 360 degrees, max and min of one and minus one. The axis is right here. This happens, everything's divided nicely into quarters. So this would be half of it. This is 90, this is 270. Okay, so that's pretty much the sine function. Not perfect, but it's pretty good. And now I want to the negative means I'm going to reflect it. So I'm going to flip it over the axis and I'm also compressing it by a half. So that means the max and minimum values are now going to be a half. 
I'm flipping it over, but the 2x, do you remember what the 2 would stand for here? So it's a horizontal compression, so we're going to do this to the slinky here. So if I compress it by 1 half, not a stretch, it's a compression because it's inside here with the x. So I want the period is going to be, if you remembered, it was 360 divided by k. And this is my k value, right? This is k. So the period is going to be 180 degrees. So that means that this whole function is going to be done in 180 degrees. So I need to redivide this into quarters and I need to have it go down first. So it's going to go down, it's going to go up, and it's going to go down. And you could continue that again. Down, it's going to go up, and it's going to go down. So that would be your sine minus a half sine 2x. Okay, and the last thing we're going to look at is an exponential function. Oh, not the very last because I have some domain and range here to look at as well. So let's say we had the function y equals 3 to the x, and I wanted you to apply this transformation to it. Now remember the transformations here, the x value is up here. It's an exponent, right? So this stuff here, the x plus 2, is going to go in for the x. So the f means what function are we transforming? We're applying this transformation to 3 to the x. So my new function would be y equals 3 to the x plus 2 and then minus 1. Okay, so make sure that you remember this sort of when the x is in the top, like it's the exponent here, right? So my mapping rule, if I did that quickly, I'd say, well, x and y go to, it says plus 2, that means I'm going to subtract 2 from the x's and I'm going to subtract 1 from the y. And there you go. Okay, so that was uh, a quick look at some transformations. And finally, domain and range. I think you probably have done enough with domain and range now that it should be pretty common to you. Domain is your x values, right? What can you put into the function and get an answer? What can you put in for x and get an answer. So sometimes, as you know, when you have something like 1 over x for a function, you can't put in 0. So that would be a domain restriction, right? x cannot be 0. But most polynomial functions, you can put in anything you want and get an answer for y. And y, of course, is um, where does a function go on the, on the graph, on the coordinate plane? Where does the function go? In other words, what are the y values? Right? That's your range. So I want to know how high and how low it goes. Function definition. Remember, we talked about functions um, that they have to pass a horizontal or sorry, vertical line test. And it means that for every value of x, there is one and only one value for y. For every value of x. There is one value for y. And I think you've done, you did enough of domain and range in grade 11. So that's kind of the um, introduction section for the textbook. It gives you a quick review of some of the key concepts that you covered in grade 11. So don't forget to subscribe. Um, hope this all finds you well and ready and willing to do your best for your grade 12 and your entry marks to university. All the best.